Hello, everyone, and welcome back to 100 Kubernetes Tools. I'm joined today by Abiram Hassan, who is an expert at making homemade hummus and also the maintainer of MirrorD, a very cool tool for Kubernetes. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Tell everyone really, really quickly, what's the problem that MirrorD is out to solve? So the problem what we try to solve with MirrorD is the long iteration times with remote environments, compiling, rebuilding, deploying, this kind of stuff that really takes long these days to have the ability to just uh, run your process locally, your service locally in the context of the remote environment, immediately from the IDE, from the CLI. Okay, but I have an objection here. I'm, I used to be a developer for many years, and that was the best part of the day. You'd like change one line of code, and then you'd go out for lunch, and you'd meet one of your friends for coffee, and your boss would ask you what's going on, and you go, oh, it's just compiling. I'm, I'm deploying to the cluster now. <laughs> so I don't need it. I can't stack off anymore. Um, yeah, so you get some slack time, but it's more planned. I, I, I really believe that you should have some uh, thinking time, especially because you're programming and fixing bugs. You need to have some idle time so you can process what's going without actually doing stuff, but you don't have to have it as a necessity. So can you show it to me? Can you show your screen and show me, like change one line of code in a project that's deployed to Kubernetes and then redeploy it in so little time that I won't be able to go and slack off. <laughs> yeah, sure. So this is a demo cluster, so it has many pods running. We have the IP visit counter deployment, which has this pod. And what the IP visit counter does, that's a Go service. And it is a very simple service. It gets a request, and then it sees the remote IP that connects to it. It checks how many times this IP has visited the service, and it increments it in Redis and returns the result. So this is a service that communicates with something in your cluster, right? Yeah. It communicates with Redis, so you can't just test this locally. Yeah, so it used Redis. It also uses a file that is from a mount and gets from an environment variable. Very simple. So I can show that if I want to run it locally, I can try, but that won't work because it won't find the file because I don't have it locally. But then when I enable MirrorD, I can just click on it. You see MirrorD enabled, and then I can click debug. And it's compiling. And once it finished comp compiling, it will let me choose um, the pod I want to work against. And I want the IP visit console because that's the service I'm working on. And I click OK. And then it does a bunch of logic. It takes some time, a few seconds. And then uh, you can see the debugger launched. And now we're running and listening on the same pod as the remote service. And I can set a breakpoint, and I will set a breakpoint to the point where it increases the counter. So now I will go here and do the curl to access the service. And you can see I got a breakpoint. I can see the data. I can see everything from the remote environment. And you can see also that the curl immediately returned because now we're in a mirroring configuration. So that means that I don't hijack the traffic. So I can just get a mirror of it. And I can peacefully go ahead and step through and see what happens and see, okay. And now you see that the count is two because the real service increased it already. And now I increased it too, so it's it's got to two. Now we'll drop the breakpoint and see what happens now. And you can see that it increased by two or three. And each time I'll do it now, it will increase by two because I have my local service handling it and I have the remote service handling it. And now you'll say, Aviram, what about if I don't want to have two different instances modifying the same state. So then I can just go ahead and go to the configuration file and change the mode from mirroring to stealing. What will happen now is that we will steal the remote pod traffic. And you can also steal based on HTTP headers. So you can choose what you want to steal. But for this simple example, we'll steal the whole port. So let's click debug and choose again. And this is how the configuration file looks, very simple. Now let's do another one to show that it only increases by one now. That's because only one service is handled, and it's my local service. So now we can go also again to this breakpoint and do another curl. See that now the curl is waiting because I'm holding the request. And now when I click, I will click continue, I will get the response back. And of course, I need to make sure that I don't really um, hold off the remote environment. And of course, the Redis is remote, the environment is remote, you can see. And also you can see that the file is remote. This text file is coming from the response string, which is 
field from a remote file in the part. So if there was another template in the remote part, I would have used that. This file doesn't exist in my local environment. I don't think I've been this excited about a demo or something on uh, 100 Kubernetes tools ever. Um, there's a lot of magic that just happened here. And this is one of these times where as soon as this video is out, maybe even beforehand, I'm going to send it to the entire robust team and say, okay, guys, now we're doing it this way. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of magic to unpack here, right? Like you just ran over this in about 120 seconds and an incredibly large amount of magic just happened with an incredibly large amount of engineering under the hood so that the user doesn't even have to care about it or think about it, right? So first you took an existing pod and you chose a pod in your cluster and then you kept the existing process running there, right? But you compiled a new process and you copied it over and you ran in the context of the original process. So now you're running the original one now. No, so it doesn't copy. So the actual execution of the process happens locally. Other solutions try to do a file synchronization. We don't believe in that method because it's hard to create a very native experience when you do that. So the process runs locally, but we have some kind of sandbox technology. It's very low level. <laughs> and basically it makes the process run locally, but the context is remote. So anything you do, we decide if it happens locally or if it happens in the remote context. You know that Arthur C. Clarke quote that any technology that's sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable for magic? So that comes <laughs> to mind a lot during this because I now realize I misunderstood even what it's doing, but what it does is even more impressive. But for the end user, it doesn't even have to care, right? That from a user perspective, I've chosen a pod. And normally when you debug it, then you have all these annoying issues because now you're going to like break on that process. And then the liveness probe is going to start fail, failing, right? But you're actually... So you're keeping the original process live. The original process is running. You're now running a, a copy of the new process locally. And when traffic comes in, then you're mirroring a copy of that traffic to your local computer. And then when your local computer reads files from the disk or when it reaches out to Redis or does stuff on the network, um, it, then that automatically accesses files inside the pod and it automatically reaches out to stuff inside the cluster. Did I get that right? Exactly, yeah. And to give more context on how the magic works, so um, as you say, as- uh, Oh, don't you... ruin it, don't ruin it. You're gonna ruin the magic. <laughs> okay, yeah, go on. Um, so you can see that when I'm debugging, you can see the mirror G agent running, and that's like a temporary agent that transfers the context for us. And when I stop the debugging, it will take it a few seconds, but it will disappear. So you don't have anything persistent in the cluster. So it's very plug and play. You don't have to wait to worry about installing something permanent. Interesting. So I think we should do a deep dive follow up mm -hmm. on the magic here and how it actually works. So if that's something you'd like to see, then please leave a comment down below and we will do a follow up on that. Okay. So just to wrap up. So if you're developing microservices on Kubernetes and you need a way to automatically apply your changes to develop locally and to like test out your changes on a real cluster. Then I think this is hands down the best way I've ever seen to do that. And you can quote me on that and put that on the testimony on your site if you'd like. Uh, it, this is hands down the best way to do that. Far better than scaffold, far better than telepresence, and far better than any other way I've ever seen. At least in this demo, it looks completely, completely smooth and seamless. And I think I'm going to tell the Robusta team to try this out. So everyone else who's watching this, um, I recommend you try this out because I don't think I've ever seen something that's that smooth of an experience for developing software that needs to run on Kubernetes. Ravi Ram, any last words to add? Um, no, th thank you for the kind feedback. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And uh, the team is working like relentlessly to make it so fun and uh, and magical and, and really creating the magic experience was one of our key goals. Like when we saw the alternatives and we saw what's going in the ecosystem, I, the reason we dug very low level and deep is because we wanted to create a magical experience. So we just want to be very uh, friendly and I'm really happy and glad to hear that it really worked and it seemed this way. Yeah, you did it. Um, <laughs> well, if people are interested, yeah, we'll do a follow up. Just leave a comment below about the wizardry that goes into this. But I think that's. Like I said, one of the more impressive demos I've ever seen. Um, so Avigram, thank you very much. And where can people find you if they have questions? 
Um, anywhere, um, and if I'm not there, let me know, I, I'll be there, but uh, mostly Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub, uh, Discord, uh, any of these platforms, uh, feel free to reach out. I uh, always love to talk with uh, fellow engineers and also our Discord is uh, for uh, a community for backend engineers. So if you have a question about architecture, about uh, uh, implementing services, go ahead and uh, leverage that ecosystem. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone.